Ready to have some fun in lab? I knew you missed this. Hold on a second. Oh, much better. Well, anyway, we're here in my barn and uh, we're gonna do the solubility product constant lab today. So uh, first thing we need to do is discuss a little bit about the, the background of KSPs. So here you go. Okay, to start our discussion of the equilibria of marginally soluble solids, let's pick an example of something that for a long time we considered to be completely insoluble in water, and that was lead fluoride. Its solubility is so low that for the longest time we couldn't really detect any lead in solutions that might have come in contact with lead fluoride. But it turns out that sure enough, when our technology got a little bit better, and our detection levels got better, we found that sure enough, marginally soluble solids like lead fluoride or mercury compounds that had for a long time been considered insoluble were actually dissolving at a very, very low concentration. Now notice that when lead fluoride dissolves, it's gonna produce a lead ion, aqueous, and two fluoride ions, just based on the formula for lead Roman numeral two fluoride. Well, when we write the equilibrium expression for this, and by the way, this equilibrium would look like this. If we had a beaker and we just threw a pile of lead fluoride into a bunch of water, it would just pretty much fall to the bottom. And like I said, for the longest time, we considered this to be completely insoluble and that this water wouldn't contain any lead ions or fluoride ions. But as our detection limits got better, we found that yes, there is an equilibrium established here where a few lead ions and fluoride ions sneak out onto the dance floor and establish an equilibrium. So as a lead fluoride might recombine and sit down on one side of the pile, immediately that makes room on the dance floor for another one on the other side of the pile. So once this becomes saturated with lead fluoride, meaning the dance floor is completely filled, the concentration of lead and fluoride are pretty much fixed at that point, and it becomes a saturated solution. Well, the equilibrium expression for that, which we call the solubility product constant, is still going to be products over reactants, but in this case, note that the reactant is a solid. So consequently, the denominator in this equilibrium expression completely disappears, and only the products appear in the equilibrium expression. Now keep in mind, we still have to raise each reactant and product to their stoichiometric coefficients. So in this case, the fluoride concentration would still be squared. The notable thing here is that there's no denominator in this equilibrium expression. So writing the equilibrium expression for a very marginally soluble solid is pretty easy considering that you only have to deal with the products. Let me show you a couple more examples. For instance, if we had something like calcium phosphate, not very soluble in water, it would establish an equilibrium with the water to release three calcium ions, each have a plus two charge, and two phosphate ions, each with a minus three charge. Well, again, these are now aqueous and would appear in the equilibrium expression. So consequently, the KSP expression for calcium phosphate would be the calcium concentration cubed and the phosphate concentration squared. So again, it's not a difficult thing. We've already been writing equilibrium expressions since two chapters ago. So now it's become actually a little easier that the reactant doesn't even appear. Let me do one more. By the way, these equilibrium expressions are just like problem number one or question number one on your pre-lab for this lab. Now the one we're going to look at today is silver acetate. It sets up an equilibrium with water to release just a few silver ions out onto the dance floor and a few acetate ions. And the KSP expression for this again, pretty simple, would be the silver concentration times the acetate concentration. So in today's lab, what we'll do is create a saturated solution of silver acetate, and we'll analyze for the molarity of the silver and the molarity of the acetate, and experimentally 
Determine then the product of these two numbers, which would be the equilibrium constant, the KSP that is, for silver acetate. Just like in the past, the magnitude of an equilibrium constant indicates the position of the equilibrium. That is, a large equilibrium constant would indicate that the equilibrium position would favor the product side, whereas a small equilibrium constant favored the reactant side. Well, the same thing goes with the magnitude of a compound's KSP. It indicates its solubility with the aqueous dissolved ions on the right and the solid on the left. A small KSP would indicate low concentrations of the ions out on the dance floor, consequently a low solubility. So we're faced with basically two problems. Determining the KSP, the actual value experimentally, given the solubility or experimentally determining the solubility like we'll do today. Or determining the solubility given the KSP. You know how we do this. Every time we show you a problem, we want you to do it forward and backward. So that's basically what this is. Now, as a matter of fact, question number two on your pre-lab is this very first problem determining the KSP given the solubility. Let me do a quick example of that so you can tackle number two on the pre-lab. Okay, well this problem is much like number two on your pre-lab where we're given the solubility of a compound and asked to calculate the KSP. So consider silver chromate, Ag2CrO4. When it dissolves, the solid sets up an equilibrium to give two silver ions and one chromate ion. Now it's not very soluble, 22 milligrams per liter. So again, that's just a crumb in a liter of water will actually dissolve. Most of it would just settle to the bottom of the beaker. Now the equilibrium expression for this, again, remember, doesn't have the solid in it. So it just has the products, the silver ion raised to its coefficient squared and the chromate ion. Well, first of all, these brackets represent moles per liter, and we were given the solubility in grams per liter. Now, you'll find in the textbook, most of the time, they'll just give you the moles per liter to plug in here and calculate the KSP. We're giving you an extra little bit of legwork to do, is to convert this into moles per liter. Well, the molecular weight of silver chromate is 331.8 grams per mole. Make that look like an 8. So we could calculate its solubility in moles per liter pretty simply. We can just take the 0 0.022 grams and say, well, and that's grams per liter. We could say, well, this weighs 331.8 grams per mole. So let's just divide this by the molecular weight. So one mole would be 331.8. Tough, 330. Holy cow. Let me do that again. 331.8 grams. This comes out to be 6.63 times 10 to the minus fifth moles per liter. Now here's the rub, is that when that many moles of silver chromate, let me put that over here, dissolve, it's going to create twice this many moles per liter of the silver, again because of the two in the coefficient, I'm sorry, in the formula for silver chromate. So consequently, if we want the concentration of silver, we're going to have to multiply this by 2. Now, not only is it multiplied by 2 because of the formula, but because of the equilibrium expression, it's also later going to be squared in our calculation. Note, however, since there's only one chromate in each molecule, then this many moles per liter of silver chromate would give you exactly that many moles per liter of the chromate ion. All right, well, let me move this and we can uh, do the final calculation. As a matter of fact, let me just scoot up a little bit. Since the KSP expression is the silver molarity, squared times the chromate molarity. Let's just plug in 2 times our 6.63 10 to the minus 5th moles per liter. This would represent the concentration then of the silver ion 
But again, not only are we doubling it because there are two silvers in each formula unit of silver chromate, but we also have to square it because of the equilibrium requirement. Well, we're going to take that times the concentration of the chromate ion, 6.63, 10 to the minus fifth moles per liter. And again, it's just to the first power because there's just a coefficient of one in its equilibrium expression. Well, this turns out to equal 1.17 times 10 to the minus 12th power. That's the KSP then for silver chromate based on the initial solubility we gave you of 0 0.022 grams per liter. Now again, this is very much like problem number two on your pre-lab, where they gave you the solubility of, I believe, strontium fluoride and asked you to calculate the KSP. So if you use this as an example, I think you can get your way through the pre-lab. Well, let's try it the other way around. Suppose we were to give you the KSP of a compound and ask you to give us the solubility in grams per liter. Now the type of problem I'm about to show you here where we're given the KSP and asked for the solubility is much like problems number four and number five that are on your pre-lab. So again, use this as an example as you're going through those problems. Now in this particular one, we're going to consider magnesium fluoride has a KSP of 7.110 to the minus ninth, very small. It sets up an equilibrium if the solid's in contact with some water to give up a few magnesium ions and twice as many fluoride ions out onto the dance floor. So its KSP expression is simply the magnesium molarity times the fluoride molarity squared. Well, for every X amount of the magnesium fluoride that sneaks out onto the dance floor, it would produce an X amount of magnesium ions, but twice that many, 2X amount of the fluoride ions. Note that the minus x that normally appeared over here in our equilibrium expression is really of no consequence since the solid does not appear in the equilibrium expression. So that means if we were to plug our variables into the equilibrium expression that we have for our KSP, given that we know the KSP is 7.110 to the minus 9th, let me just scooch this up a little bit, we can plug in what we know, 7.110 to the minus 9th, would be equal to the magnesium molarity, which we've represented by x, and the fluoride molarity, which we've represented by 2x, squared. Well, essentially then, 7.1 times 10 to the minus 9th, oop, make that look like a 9, is equal to 4x cubed. Well, easy enough to solve for x in this case. x is simply going to be the cube root of 7.1, 10 to the minus 9th, divided by 4. I divided that across before I took the cube root. Well, x turns out to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3rd moles per liter of magnesium fluoride. So again, if they had simply asked for the, mol the molar solubility of magnesium fluoride, we'd be done. This is moles per liter, that's the molarity. But in questions number four and five on the pre-lab, they went on to ask, what's the solubility in grams per liter? To do that, we need to multiply by the molecular weight. Well, the molecular weight for magnesium fluoride turns out to be 62.3. So I'm gonna multiply by 62.3 grams per mole. This turns out to be 0 0.075 grams per liter which again reflects how insoluble magnesium fluoride is. This is only 75 milligrams of this compound will dissolve in an entire liter of water. Now, one thing I should note here, question number four on your pre-lab is manganous carbonate. It's MN, let me write it over here, MnCO3. It splits up into just an X number of manganese ions and an X number of carbonate ions. So actually the math for this is much easier you could set x times x equal to the KSP and solve for that. On the other hand, question number five uses zinc hydroxide. And ultimately what you need to find out is the hydroxide molarity. Well, remember in this case, this will be x, this will end up being two x squared and set then equal to the KSP. So 
again, be very careful because the hydroxide molarity is represented by 2x. That will lead you to the pOH and ultimately then to the pH of that solution, which is what they're asking for. So that should get you through several of the problems on the pre-lab. I've got one more that I want to show you before we get to the actual experiment today. All right, in this problem, and this one's a little bit more complex, it's like problem number three that's on your pre-lab. So again, you can use this kind of as an example to do that. We want to know if we were to mix two solutions together, in this case we're mixing 175 milliliters of a solution that contains potassium chloride, and we've given you the molarity. We're mixing it with 145 mils of a certain molarity of silver nitrate. Well, it turns out that silver chloride, when these two are on the same dance floor, they can't be there in any great number because the KSP for silver chloride is very small. It's 1.77 times 10 to the minus 10th. So what we need to know is, did we overcrowd the dance floor, even though we brought the chloride in one vehicle and we brought the silver in another and then released them both out into the same beaker, did we exceed what the KSP would allow? You can almost visualize that the KSP is sort of the size of the dance floor. If we overpack the dance floor, then somebody's going to have to sit down. All right, well, that introduces something that we looked at back in our equilibrium chapter, which was called the Q sub C, which used the equilibrium expression but put in the current molarities so that we could predict which way the equilibrium would shift to sort of reestablish itself. In this particular instance, the QSP would be the same as the KSP expression for silver chloride, which is just silver raised to the first power and chloride raised to the first power. Again, no solid in the denominator here. And if we put in the current molarities of the silver ion and the chloride ion, this would equal the QSP, the current conditions where we are right now. The KSP is where it wants to be. So if the QSP exceeds the KSP value, which we were given, 1.77 to the minus 10th, then precipitation occurs, meaning we got the dance floor just too crowded, somebody had to sit down. The real problem here is calculating what the current molarity of silver is, given that we mixed two volumes of two different molarities. So what we need to figure out is how many total millimoles of silver did we add how many total millimoles of chloride did we add, divided by the new total volume, so that we can sort of calculate the new molarity of the silver and the chloride after these two solutions were mixed. So remember, we just need the product of those two molarities to find the QSP, and then we'll compare it to the KSP. So let me switch pages here, and we'll go ahead and calculate how many millimoles of each we had. Okay, so here's our calculation for the current concentration of the chloride ion and the silver ion once we mix these two solutions together. Note what I've done here. I've taken the volume in milliliters of the KCl solution times its molarity, which essentially is millimoles per milliliter, to calculate that there were 0.963 millimoles of chloride in that 175 milliliters of the solution. I did the same thing with the silver. Its volume was 145 milliliters. Its molarity was 0 0.0015 millimoles of silver nitrate per milliliter. Note I'm ignoring the nitrate and the potassium as spectator ions. I'm only interested in the silver and the chloride. And note that we found 0.218 millimoles of silver in the solution. Now, both of these have been mixed together in a total volume of 320 milliliters, the sum of these two volumes. So if we divide each of these millimoles by the total volume, we can calculate their current molarity. Again, we had to recast this since the total volume has changed. Well, 0.218 millimoles of silver divided by 320 came out to be 6.8 10 to the minus fourth molar in silver ions. Whereas the chloride was 0.963 millimoles over 320 came out to be 3 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Now this is what's currently on the dance floor. What we need to know is, did we exceed the size of the dance floor, which is dictated by the KSP? So let me scooch this up here a little bit. What I did was calculate the QSP the, with using the current molarities that we just calculated. And we find that the QSP, the current conditions, lists the silver as 6.8 10 to the minus 4, 3 times 10 to the minus 3 for the chloride. That product 
is 2 times 10 to the minus 6th. But the KSP was much, much smaller, 1.77, 10 to the minus 10th. So we have greatly exceeded what the KSP should allow in the solution. So the answer is yes, precipitation does occur. Now clearly in problems where the QSP would come out less than the KSP would simply imply the opposite, that there's still additional room for more to dissolve. Consequently, there would be no precipitation. But in this case, we far exceeded the KSP. So again, problem number three on your pre-lab has you mixing uh, a solution of sodium hydroxide and something with calcium in it, I believe. And again, you have to recalculate the current molarities in order to see if you've exceeded the KSP. All right, well now, let's take a look at the actual experiment for today. Now that we've kind of gone through examples that you'll need for the pre-lab and the subsequent questions that are on the back of your report sheet for today's lab. In today's experiment, we're going to experimentally determine the KSP for silver acetate. But the first thing we need to do is to create a saturated solution of silver acetate, meaning a dance floor that's completely packed. So we're going to introduce 25 milliliters of 0.3 molar sodium acetate. So this is the vehicle for our acetate to get there. And 25 milliliters of 0.2 molar silver nitrate. This is how we're getting the silver ion in there. Now, the mixture of these two is going to far exceed the KSP. We're really overpacking the floor so that all the excess is going to precipitate out. But from this molarity and this volume, we can calculate the number of initial moles of acetate we introduced. And we can calculate the number of initial moles of silver that we added. This will be important to our calculation of what remained on the dance floor. We are going to take a small portion of this solution and analyze it for the concentration of the silver. When you take a small portion of a larger sample for analysis, they refer to that small portion as an aliquot. I always like that word, aliquot. So we're going to take a 10 milliliter aliquot of this 50 milliliter solution and analyze it for the silver. Now this is what I thought was so clever about this lab when I stole it from the University of Montana, was that once we analyze for the silver that's still out on the dance floor, we don't have to analyze for the acetate. We can use sort of a stoichiometric backdoor way to figure it out. Because knowing how much silver is still out here dancing and knowing how much came to the dance, the initial amount, we can figure out how much silver had to sit down. And when it sat down, it sat down one-on-one -on -one with each acetate. So suddenly we know how many acetates sat down. Well, given we know how many are sitting and how many came to the dance, the difference between these two should tell us how much acetate is still out on the floor. I just thought that was kind of clever the way they did this so that we only had to analyze for one of the ions and figured out the other one. We'll then plug those molarities into our KSP expression and come up with our experimental determination for the KSP of silver acetate. What we'd normally have you do in the lab and what I'm going to demonstrate for you today is set up two burettes. One is going to have your filtered saturated silver acetate solution in it that we're going to create today. And again, we had to filter out all that excess solid that was in the bottom of the beaker and I'll show that on, on our little movie today. So we're going to fill the burette with that. The other burette we're going to fill with our titrant that we're going to analyze the silver with and it's 0.1 molar potassium thiocyanate. Now essentially, here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna take a 50 mil beaker and drain a 10 milliliter portion of our saturated silver acetate solution into a 50 mil beaker. I'm gonna add a little indicator, a little nitric acid, and then I'm gonna titrate it with potassium thiocyanate to an orange endpoint. Now it turns out the potassium thiocyanate reacts in a one to one mole to mole ratio with the silver. So however many moles of thiocyanate I added here, that represents the number of moles of silver that were actually in this 10 milliliter aliquot of our larger 50 milliliter solution. Let me scooch this up. So a little more detail on our titration. The potassium thiocyanate reacts with the silver, like I said, in a one to one mole to mole ratio to form silver thiocyanate, a white precipitate kind of a snowflake looking precipitate. You'll see it in our demonstration. 
But once the silver is gone, the first excess drop of potassium thiocyanate reacts with the iron that's in our indicator to form iron thiocyanate, which is blood red in solution. So this is what gives us our endpoint. Now the moles of thiocyanate used in the titration is easy to calculate. We just need how many milliliters we used in the titration, which shouldn't take us more than five or six milliliters. Divide that by a thousand to convert it into liters and multiply by how strong we made the potassium thiocyanate titrant. It was 0.1 moles per liter. So this should tell us then the number of moles of silver that were actually in that 10 milliliter portion of our 50 milliliter solution. So let's go ahead and run the lab and do the titrations and then I'll run you through all the calculations that you need for your report sheet. Okay, so our first step is to make a saturated solution of silver acetate. Silver acetate is not very soluble in water, so it's pretty easy to overpack the dance floor and make everybody sit down. So we're going to put an excess amount of acetate and an excess amount of silver, more than the solution is allowed to hold. We're going to let all the excess precipitate out. So we're going to do this by adding 25 milliliters of 0.3 molar sodium acetate to 25 milliliters of 0.2 molar silver nitrate. So the sodium acetate will be our delivery for the acetate ion, the silver nitrate for the silver ion. Separately, they're both very soluble in water, but the minute we put the two together, the silver and the acetate can't be on the dance floor in any quantity that exceeds what the KSP would allow. So let me go ahead and set this up. I got a 250 milliliter beaker. I'm gonna go ahead and drain 25 mils of sodium acetate into the beaker. Okay, there we go. We just about got it, 25 mils. Shut this off right on the mark. And now we'll add the 25 milliliters of silver nitrate to it. And you're gonna see that it's gonna to begin to precipitate almost immediately because the silver and the acetate just are not soluble when they're both together in a solution. Now we're going to stir this for a half hour and allow it to completely react. We'll filter out all the excess solid and leave just a nice saturated solution of silver acetate to analyze. And here we go, we're almost at the 25 mil mark. And there it is. So we have 50 mils of silver nitrate and sodium acetate mixed together. We're going to put it up on the stir plate and let it stir for a half hour. Okay, I've got myself a little stir plate here. You can use magnetic stirring bar. I'll set it up to stir. Now again, we're going to let this go for a half an hour, so I'll be back in 30 minutes. Okay, well, it's been 30 minutes. We've been letting it stir, and there's quite a bit of solid that's formed in here. All the excess silver acetate has precipitated out of the solution. But we need to get rid of that excess solid so that we just have a nice, clear, filtered solution to analyze. So I'm going to use a, a filter funnel and a small 150 mil beaker. Give me just a second and I'll get the filter paper. Okay, filter paper is round. We'll fold it into quarters. Open up one side of it. We put it down in our filter funnel. See that? And very slowly filter our solution. This is going to take some time, and so I'm going to fade in and fade out. Okay, well, we filtered our solution. Now we have a nice, clear, filtered silver acetate solution, completely saturated. In my burettes here, I have filled one with our titrant, which is 0.1 molar potassium thiocyanate. There you go. And I'm going to fill the other burette 
with our filtered saturated silver acetate solution. Now again, we're going to do a couple trials. We only need 10 milliliters for each trial, so we should have plenty since we filtered a 50 milliliter quantity. There we go, got it zeroed. And so now, let me pause and, and give you a quick explanation again of how this titration works so that we're, we can analyze this saturated solution for how much silver is actually still floating around in their aqueous. So a little more detail on our titration. The potassium thiocyanate reacts with the silver, like I said, in a one-to-one mole-to-mole -mole ratio to form silver thiocyanate, a white precipitate, kind of a snowflake-looking precipitate. You'll see it in our demonstration. But once the silver is gone, the first excess drop of potassium thiocyanate reacts with the iron that's in our indicator to form iron thiocyanate, which is blood red in solution. So this is what gives us our endpoint. Now the moles of thiocyanate used in the titration is easy to calculate. We just need how many milliliters we used in the titration, which shouldn't take us more than five or six milliliters. Divide that by a thousand to convert it into liters and multiply by how strong we made the potassium thiocyanate titrant. It was 0.1 moles per liter. So this should tell us then the number of moles of silver that were actually in that 10 milliliter portion of our 50 milliliter solution. Okay, to begin this titration, we're gonna to need to take a 10 milliliter aliquot of this 50 milliliter sample that we have of our saturated silver acetate solution. So I'm gonna drain out, I filled this burette with our filtered solution. I'm gonna get a 10 milliliter sample of it. It's like watching paint dry, isn't it? Okay, there we go, 10 milliliters on the button. Now, as we do this titration, we're gonna use a ferric alum indicator and as soon as we put it in here, it's gonna turn kind of a reddish color and that masks the end point that we wanna see. So we're gonna put a little squirt of nitric acid in there just to clear up that red color. Okay, here's the ferric alum indicator I'm gonna put in. Put in a few drops. And you can see that this is turning kind of a reddish color And again, that's going to mask the color, the endpoint color, which is kind of an orangish color uh, when we do the titration. So I'm going to put a little nitric acid in it. Should clear it up. Milliliter. That seemed to do the trick. Now we've got a reasonably clear solution that we can titrate with. Now as we titrate, it's going to form kind of a white snowflake compound in there of silver thiocyanate. It reacts in a one-to-one -one relationship, the potassium thiocyanate with the silver that's in the, in the solution. As soon as that first excess drop of potassium thiocyanate goes in after the silver has all been used up, it should turn the solution a uh, kind of a reddish color. But since there's that white flaky uh, silver thiocyanate in here, it's going to be kind of an orangish color. So I'm going to bring the camera a little closer while we do the titration, and you'll see. Okay, so as I begin the titration, you'll see the formation of this silver thiocyanate. Like I said, it kind of looks like a snow globe, and you can see that as each drop of titrant hits, it forms the iron thiocyanate, which quickly dissipates. So what we want to do is titrate this to a persistent orange color. I'll just cut to the end of the titration and we'll check the volume of titrant used. Still not quite there. Maybe one more drop. Two. Oh, it's fading, it's fading. I'm gonna add one more. And that looks like we've hit the end point. 
Now we've got a nice persistent orange color. Let me scan up here and we'll look at the volume that we actually used. It appears we used almost seven milliliters. As a matter of fact, let's read this really close. It looks like a little more than 6.9, maybe 6.92. That's what we'll use in the calculation. Okay, let's try our second titration, our second trial. I drained another 10 milliliter sample of our saturated solution from our other burette. So now we're at 20. And I refilled the burette with the potassium thiocyanate, our titrant. So again, I, I know this is going to take around 7, so I'm going to, going to go ahead and drain this down to around 6. And then we'll sneak up on it drop by drop. Well, I notice it's not turning orange. That's probably because I forgot to add the indicator. Hold on just one second. Okay, so I've added the indicator now and the nitric acid to get rid of the red color. We'll start dribbling this in. See if we can hit approximately the same endpoint we did last time. Now we're at approximately six and a half milliliters. I'm going to slow down the additions here because I want one drop to make it a persistent orange. It always reminded me of a snow globe, that silver thiocyanate. I'm going to get the stirrer going just a little faster. Okay, let's get this end point right on the nose. Well, that looks like almost a persistent orange. It looks like it's going to fade. I'm going to add one more drop. There we go. All right, that looks like a persistent orange color. Let's take a peek here. Looks like about 7.15 milliliters. Maybe 1.3, 7.13. Well, now that we've done the two titrations, it's just a matter of calculations at this point. So let me switch to the overhead and we'll run through the calculations. Okay, well, here's our report sheet for this lab. Note that we'll all have the same volumes here for our solu saturated solution we made. We used 25 milliliters of the 0.2 molar silver nitrate and 25 milliliters of the 0.3 molar sodium acetate for a grand total of 50 milliliters. Again, this was a misprint. It shouldn't say solution number one and two. It should just say trial one and trial two because we're using the same solution. Now, the first thing they ask you is how many moles of, a, of initial silver did we actually put in? How, meaning how much silver is in that 25 mils of 0.2 molar? Well, to calculate that, we just take the 25 mils. And just for instruction purposes, whenever I use a line number, I'll circle it. So I'm going to use what's in line one, the 25 milliliters, divided by 1,000 to change it into liters. Take it times the molarity of the silver nitrate. That would tell me then the number of moles of silver initially present. I'm going to do the same thing with the acetate. Take line two, divide it by a thousand to change it into liters, and multiply by its molarity, the 0.3. This tells me the initial moles of silver and acetate that we threw in. Well, let me scooch this up a little bit. We can see what's next. Make sure I've got everything on the screen here. You'll note that the milliliters of the silver acetate solution that we used in the titration was the same for both trials. We used a 10 milliliter aliquot, so 10.00 and 10.00. This is the point at which we did the titration. We found that in the first titration, it took 6.92 milliliters of the potassium thiocyanate to do the job. In our second trial, it took 7.13 milliliters of the titrant. In order to figure out, well, how many moles of silver then were in the aliquot, it's the same as the number of moles of potassium thiocyanate. So again, we just need to change this into liters by dividing it by 1,000. I took line 7 divided by 1,000 times the molarity then of the potassium thiocyanate. So this essentially tells us how many moles of silver were in the 10 milliliter aliquot. Well, then they asked you, well, how much was in the original 50 mils then? Well, if this was a 10 mil sample of a larger 50 mil porch sample, then we just simply need to multiply this by five. 
Now we want to express that in terms of moles per liter. We know how many moles, we know it was in 0.05 liters. So let's divide line nine by 0 0.05 liters. That essentially is gonna tell us one of the two pieces that we need then for the KSP, moles per liter of the silver ion. To find the moles of silver precipitated, what we need to do is take the difference between what we initially put in, which is line four, and how many were still floating around in the solution, which is line nine. So the original pile was line four, so we'll take line four, subtract from that line nine. That's essentially going to tell us then how many moles of the silver had to sit down. Now here's what I thought was interesting, is that when the silver sits down, it takes one acetate with it. So it turns out that line 12, the number of moles of acetate that precipitated, is equal to line 11. Well, now line 13 says, well, how many moles of acetate are still out on the dance floor then floating around? Well, we know how many sat down, and from up above, we know how many we initially put into the solution. So let me scooch up a little bit more. Line 13 is just going to be line 5 minus line 12. But we need to express that in moles per liter. So again, we're going to take line 13, the number of moles of acetate in the 50 milliliters, and divide it by the 0 0.050 liters. This gives us our second piece of information that we need to calculate the KSP. All we need is the product of the moles per liter of acetate and the moles per liter of silver. So in essence then, line 15, the KSP, is going to be line 10 times line 14. Now that runs through the entire set of calculations to find our experimental KSP for silver acetate. Below, they want you to calculate the accepted value. Now, I gave instructions for how to find the accepted value on page 4 of your lab. As a matter of fact, let me overlay this. Line 15 in your instructions says that given that the solubility of silver acetate is 10.2 grams per liter, calculate the accepted value. Well, here's a little tip on how to do that. To find the accepted value, it's 10.2 grams per liter of silver acetate. Well, we need to change that to moles per liter by using the molecular weight of the silver acetate. And remember that you'll get this many moles per liter of silver and the same number of moles per liter of acetate. So in essence, then, that number is going to plug in for each of these molarities. That will give you the accepted value for the KSP. Once you've done that, they want a percent error. So in essence, you've got to take your value minus the accepted value divided by the accepted value times 100%. Note that I've left your room down here for all your calculations. So if you can't get them on this space, put it on a separate page. And when you submit this by either scanning it or taking a picture with your phone, make sure that you include your calculations when you submit your lab. On the back of the report sheet, you'll note there's three questions back here. One where they give you the KSP and they ask you for solubility, which we went over earlier. One where they've given you the solubility and asked for the KSP. Again, we went over this. Note that they've given it in grams per 100 milliliters. You're going to have to bump that up by a factor of 10 to make it grams per liter. And then number three is a prediction of precipitation. Now remember, we're adding two volumes together, so you're going to have to find the new molarity of the lead, the new molarity of the chloride after the two have been mixed, and compare that to the KSP that you found just above in problem number two. Remember, this is a QSP compared to KSP to determine whether or not a precipitation will occur. Well, hopefully all these little tips will help you get through the lab. Well, hopefully this wasn't too painful a way for you to do the labs. Um, let me know what you think. If you have any questions about the calculations, please just email me or text me and I'll get right back to you. 
So we'll have another lab ready for you in a week or so. I'll keep you posted online. So just watch your ICC email. See you later.